Well, hello, I'd like to welcome you to the great state of Arizona, the city of Tucson, and most importantly, the Pima County. And in case you don't know it, this is one of our first YouTube interviews. I'm Darrell Parrish Bakeman, and I am delighted to be the one who gets to, to interview our recorder, Gabriella Cazares Kelly. Good evening, Gabriella. Hi there. You know, a lot of people know very little about you. Can you give us a brief overview about you, how you got to this office and when you came? Um, sure thing. Um, since this is an introductory, um, I'll start off with a proper introduction. Skuktash Anyanyapjugi Gabriela Casares Kelly, Pesimo Ochkup Anjud, Anyamud Kapima Chukshan Ohahandam. Hi, my name is Gabriela Casares Kelly. I'm from the communities of Pisinmo'o and Kup, which are located on the Thonotham Nation, which is right here in beautiful Pima County, where I've been a lifelong resident. And I am now serving as your Pima County recorder. I was elected in uh, 2000 and took office in 2021. My office oversees voter registration, early voting, and document recording for the county. We have around 624,000 registered voters here. And so I'm responsible uh, for the data retention of, of all of those. And I um, entered this field um, kind of in a non-traditional way. Um, I was an educator. I used to work at a tribal community college. And one day I volunteered to host a voter registration table. I thought it would be super easy to do. And as it turns out, it's not. <laughs> it's not always super easy, uh, especially for uh, voters who live in tribal communities um, or rural communities. Um, There's some additional things that people need to know um, about those voters. And um, it led me down a wormhole that I have fully, <laughs> I fully climbed in. Um, and here we are a few years later. You mentioned some special things that people in rural and tribal areas have to do. This is not focusing on that, but why don't you enlighten us? Because sometimes people think registering to vote is easy. You only need ID. Right. Um, for uh, people in communities um, like the Thonotham Nation, um, tribal community, reservation, um, uh, there's a, a lot of times there are people who don't have driver's licenses. They're you know, the closest motor vehicle division is sometimes an hour, maybe two hours away. Um, if your family only owns one vehicle or maybe doesn't own a vehicle, um, your motivation for getting a driver's license or a state ID is lessened. Um, <clears throat> there's also, depending on the community, um, some tribal communities that are located in rural areas don't have um, physical addresses. So an address like 7251 North Cactus Drive doesn't exist out there. Um, and so people will more likely use a PO box number or HCO1 box number. Um, and when you ask for a physical address, you know, you might get you might get a, a confused look on, on someone's face because why would you need that? You have my PO box number. Um, of course, that information is required so that we can put you in the appropriate uh, jurisdiction um, and so that you're in the right precinct. Um, and it helps determine who represents you. And so um, in those communities, we recommend that people put their place uh, name. So for me, if I were registering in the community where I grew up, I would put Pisinimo Village in the Pisinimo district. Um, and that is very easy to understand um, within my community. Um, but again, it's, it's difficult if you don't know and people are just like, what do I have to do uh, to fill out this form? There's an area on the Arizona voter registration form that says if you live in a if you have a physical description please draw a map well the thought of the nation is the size of connecticut most people have no idea it's there and when you're talking about some of these rural communities um i literally cannot give you at ad my address or directions without talking about dirt roads 
and uh, take a left at the big tree. Um, those are literally uh, my directions to get to my home where I was grow where I grew up. And so, you know, sometimes I get a little lost in the paperwork and people don't know how to fill that out on paper. And people who are in positions like yours don't know how to ask the right questions. <laughs> That's often the, that's <laughs> often the case, but luckily, uh, for those, um, I I'm the first Native American to um be elected to this position. Um, I'm the first Native American to be elected in a countywide seat to begin with, and I'm only the the third and fourth um recorder or countywide elected in the state. And I bring with me that unique information of, of an understanding of that community. And so I speak the language of that community, um, not, not necessarily like a like um, the Thanawatham language, but I, I speak the language that the community uses in English. And so being able to explain mm -hmm. what I mean when I'm asking you in English how to fill out the form, um, you know, makes a really big difference. And I was able to bring that here to the office and train my staff so that when somebody calls and says, I live in Hikwan district, they know what that means. This was the best explanation I have ever heard of why we need diversity at the top levels of government. Thank you so much, Gabriella. <laughs> that was a perfect explanation. And I'm you're well suited for this position. Given all of that, and thank you for sharing the role of your office, there has been a lot of dialogue out here in our legislative district about purging that's happening with the voter rolls. Can you speak to that at all so that the people who are looking at this video will understand what is happening? Absolutely. So it's very important to know that um, we're very careful about the use of the word purging. Purging is, is a scary um, sounding term. Many people think it's widespread and it's just happening willy nilly. Um, that is absolutely not the case. My office, the recorder's office, is responsible for the daily maintenance of voter rolls at 365, every single day of the year, we are doing voter maintenance. And that is because on any given day, uh, we may have up to 500 people who move into the county, move out of the county, who have passed away, who've um, uh, canceled their voter registration, who've updated an address, a name, a party. Um, there's so many different things that people make daily changes on, uh, maybe the way that they're going to receive a ballot. Um, and so what happens with everything that we do in this office, um, everything is tied to an address. Again, I was talking about the importance of a physical address. Um, and so what we do when somebody registers to vote, part of our check pro uh, process um, to confirm that a person lives where they say they do is to send mail there. If that mail gets bounced back or if it's returned by the sender, um, we send a different type of, of mail. Um, one to make sure that um, it is a, a piece of mail that is eligible to be forwarded to an address. So um, your ballot, for example, it cannot be forwarded and it would automatically be returned to us if it was undeliverable. Um, but we can send just a first class letter and have that letter um, be sent to you that says, hey, we tried to send you some mail and we got it bounced back. If we get that next piece of mail, which now means two pieces of mail, mm -hmm. if they have been mailed back to us and we receive that here, um, we then start a clock for 35 days by federal law. If a voter does not respond within that time period, we then um, put them on, it is the um, National Voter Registration Act process, which means that that voter after 35 days, if we have not heard back from them, if we have, they haven't come in, they haven't called us, they haven't responded to our mail, they haven't emailed our office or anything, we just have no idea where this person lives, um, we put them in an inactive status. 
That means that if that person does walk in, we can say, hey, we've been looking for you. Well, let's update your voter registration because we're trying to send you mail and you're not getting it. And so um, something as simple as them uh, calling, um, coming in to vote, um, uh, they could even sign a petition if they if their name randomly gets selected for signature verification and they're sh we're showing that they're engaged somehow, we take them off that list. Um, however, if after two federal cycles, um, which is a total of four years, if a voter has never contacted the office, they have never responded. We cannot send them mail. We have never confirmed that this person is in fact the voter. We then remove them from our voter rolls after two federal cycles. At so any point, mm -hmm. they can re-register, they can update. Um, we're, and, and, and it's important to know that two federal cycles would include the midterm election and the presidential election. Um, so after a president presidential election year in 2025, you will see that number drop down again. That's significant. So do you start with your existing roles to send out the communication to verify that they're still a voter? And are, in order to send out mail, do you start with what you have or is there another procedure you use? So it, it's a, uh, there's a, um there's a number of different things that we're doing. So number one, when the register voters, when the voter registers for the very first time, we send them their mail to confirm. We send them a voter ID card. Um, we also, for those who are registered for the active early voting list, which is the mail voting list, we send them what we call a 90 day notice. Um, and so we send them uh, a notice 90 days before an election to let them know, hey, this election is coming. If you need to make any changes, let us know. Um, and if we have any of those returned, um, that would put you in an inactive. Um, the next would be a ballot. If we mail your ballot and a ballot comes back to us um, and it's not able to be forwarded, um, we definitely need to hear from that voter um, and so it, it is any of those processes um, within a four year period mm -hmm. to a federal election cycles. And so it's it's pretty significant for somebody to register and never make any additional contact uh, for a very long time. So this is important. What you're yes. saying to someone who's listening to this, if you want to vote, you have to remain active on the roll. It, it rolls, it's your responsibility to communicate with the recorder's office first to make sure you are listed with your current address so that you can vote. And if we send you some mail, you must respond either by what we're asking you to do, by voting, by calling, by going online to let us know you still exist and live at the address so we can stay in communication with you. Because if you don't, you might end up not on the list and not being able to vote. So the the message is voters have to remain engaged in the process, not just show up at the polls or expect the ballots coming through the mail. They, it's their responsibility to make sure that they're on the list. Is that correct? Almost. Uh, we're almost correct there. If there is a person who chooses to register to vote, but never, um, they get their mail, but they never respond to it. They even get their ballot and maybe they never vote it. That person will still remain on the voter rolls because we have not received anything back. Oh. So that is the major difference. So it's only for people who are experiencing a situation where your mail will be returned to our office. A lot of times this happens accidentally when people go on vacation during an election, they expect their, their ballot to be forwarded. And like I said, by federal law, that is not possible. We cannot forward your mail um, to you. We cannot uh, forward a ballot. The, the US Post Office cannot forward a ballot to you. However, you can call our office and you can say, I'm going to be in Ohio for a whole month and I need my ballot mailed uh, to this address in Ohio and we will gladly accommodate. 
Um, this is the same for if there's somebody who's going on a cruise um, <laughs> or going to be somewhere, um, you know, abroad. Uh, maybe they're going to be on a fancy French vacation for a whole month and are going to miss those deadlines. Um, we have options for those voters. Um, we have military and overseas provisions so that um, as long as they're in contact with us, we can provide them the the proper paperwork to get signed up and we could actually email them a ballot or mail a ballot all the way to France. And so um, there's always an option, but um, if your mail is getting returned to us, that's when you're going to run into issues. And a lot of times that happens um, because people are going on vacation or often because they maybe did a change of address form with the post office, thinking that that automatically came to our office, um, but it doesn't. You ha we cannot make changes to your voter registration without your signature. We cannot make changes. Um, you know, sometimes people have multiple properties. Sometimes yep. they, you have no idea what, what a voter is doing or where they're actually staying. Um, and so we need them to initiate and, and update with us. This is so important because I think some people think they're minions running around taking people off the voter rolls, and that's not happening. It's up to the voter to make sure that they can still vote. And right. if you are on the active list or believe you're on that active send me a ballot list, how can you make sure that you're still on it? Super Just, easy. This yeah. is this is amazing. You can visit our website, recorder.pima.gov. And you can check your voter registration. You can do that. Any one of the 624,000 registered voters in Pima County, you are able to look that up. On there, you will see whether or not you are, number one, if you're registered. Number two, if you are signed up to vote in the active early voting list. Uh, number three, you will see all of the different districts that you live in um, so you can better understand who represents you and which districts you live in. Um, and then the last thing, which is really neat, you can also see your, your voting history. And I want to be really clear. It doesn't mean who exactly you voted for, um, but what you can see is that you participated in an election um, and it'll show you the way that you, you participated. So if you look at mine, you'll see literally three pages going back to um, the year 2000, um, where I first voted in my very first election. Um, and you'll see that I voted at a, a polling location. And then as um, you look at the more recent, you'll see that I participate now by early voting sites. So all of that information is available. And the other thing I would strongly recommend is signing up for our text or email alerts. So when you come and check your voter registration, um, the same page that you sign in, you can then sign up uh, to get email or text message alerts sent directly to your phone. We will send you a text message when, um, you know, as we're preparing um, your ballot, when it's mailed out when we've received it back, when it's been signature verified, and then finally, when it's been turned over to the elections department for tabulation. It's fabulous. We love it. Um, and we are encouraging more and more people to um, sign up to receive those alerts. And how do people sign up so we can put, I'll make sure we put it across the stream while we're saying it. So why don't you repeat that again? So you can visit recorder.pima.gov click on check your voter registration. Or if you have a hard time with our website or you're just, no, I'm, that's too much work, you can just give us a call at 520-724-4330. And one of my very helpful staff members will make sure that you're signed up. That's wonderful information to have. Thank you very much, Gabby. The other thing I want to talk about, because there are two more issues I want to cover before we end this call, and that is the locations for voting. Can you tell people what the options are for voting? We talked a little bit about mail, but let's talk about locations, because I was reading in the Tucson agenda today that there's some things that our legislators are trying to do. But first, I want to know what exists today. Then we can talk about the things that people are talking about? So um, each, each 
uh, election is unique. It's very important to know that. Uh, we do our very best to try to have the same places um, over and over available to the public, but sometimes it we really can't help it. Sometimes there's construction in, in one location or, or there's a program that can't move. Um, and so it, it's really important for you to look up your locations before you come visit. Um, the, the worst thing is hearing... Um, frustrated voters going to the place that they always voted and finding out that's no longer a voting location. Um, so my office, the Pima County Recorder's Office, is responsible for early voting. That means everything before um, election day. So the 27-day period, um, the day we mail out the ballots, all the way till the day before elections is my responsibility. And um, Typically, what we've had in the past is we've only had our main offices open. So that was only three locations open for a presidential preference election. I, however, am very committed to uh, providing opportunities for people to participate in rural locations um, because I grew up rural. I, I That is always close to my heart. My family lives rural. Um, I want to make sure that we um, are present in the community. And so what we have done is we have expanded our early voting options during the presidential preference election. Um, we went from three locations to now we have 10. Um, and 10 of those locations, um, they are open for just a few days here or there. So you're really going to want to make sure that you, you check our website and look at voting sites. Um, to see what your most, uh, what your closest location uh, will be. Um, and then on election day, the election day is facilitated completely by the elections department. And my office worked really closely with the elections department to um, provide electronic poll books, which now means that any voter in Pima County can vote at any location closest to their home, school, work, wherever they're planned for the day, shopping, um, wherever is most convenient for you to participate on election day, you can walk in there and no one is going to say you're in the wrong location. They are going to provide you with your ballot. That's wonderful. So are these called polls still or are they have a different name now? So they are called vote centers Vote and on center. election day. So uh, voting locations will be the recorder's office, we have vote voting early voting locations, and then the elections department has vote centers, uh, but they essentially do the same, the, the same thing. One unique thing uh, to early voting is that because it is an extension of our office, the recorder's office, who is responsible for voter maintenance and role maintenance, you, if you are experiencing an issue, if you've ever had an issue um, when voting, um, if somebody's ever told you you're not on a list um, or something like that, or maybe you've moved and you're not quite sure where to go, that is the best opportunity for you to not only go there and cast your ballot, but also make sure that your record is up to date. Our staff will personally take care of that and in, and alert you of any things uh, that you might be experiencing, um, such as maybe maybe you were inactive and need to fill out a new voter registration form, um, or maybe we have a note on our our records that say um, your signature was. Uh, questioned last time, let's get a new signature. Because you're there in person, that's one of the benefits of um, coming to early voting. So coming to early voting where they can do, tell us again where they can have that done in person one more time. So there will be 10 locations and they are open various dates throughout the 27 days prior to election. And you can find that information on recorder.pima.gov and visit our site called Voting Sites. Mm -hmm. Okay, That's great. And I do have that... one other very important thing um, to share about the upcoming presidential preference election, Okay, um, which is that the presidential preference election is a political party election that is facilitated by the counties. And what that means is the political parties get to decide 
who can participate and who cannot. And uh, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party have both chosen to have um, elections and only members of those registered parties will be able to participate. This is very different from every other election where independent or no party designated voters normally are able to simply walk in and ask for the ballot of the party that they would like to participate in. But for this election, if you are independent or no party designated, you will not be able to participate. So uh, let's be clear about this. We're talking about the PPE, the presidential preference election, which happens every four years, where you are not electing the president, you're electing delegates to go to the respective party conventions who will then put your, the candidate that you voted for on, they will elect, the put those people, they will vote for those people at the convention. So that's what's the presidential preference. It's you're deciding which candidate you want to have presented at the convention by voting for those individuals who are on the ballot who will represent them. Am I speaking correctly? That is accurate. Yes. Okay. Now, the other thing that you're trying to tell us, which is critical, this is a state that's a third, a third, a third, I heard. Yes, and so is. if you are not a registered Democrat or Republican right now, because those are the only two that have presented the appropriate paperwork that's telling your office that they are going to be on the ballot on the presidential preference election date, which is March 19th. Correct. Tuesday, March 19th. Coming That's up. That's right. So it's very, it's coming up very, very soon. So what has to happen is if someone else, some other party decides they want to be represented, they would have to get their pe paperwork to whom and by when? Well, the, the deadline for them to request a, or um, actually what happened this cycle is um, the other parties, other political parties um, chose not to have a, a presidential preference election. But if you are an independent or no party designated voter, or maybe you belong to a party that is not having a presidential preference election, and you want to participate in either the Democratic Party or the Republican Party's presidential preference, preference election, you must register to vote by February 20th, 2024 by midnight. So if you're currently listed as a, 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 for a party other than Democrat or Republican, you have to re-register for that particular party that you want to vote for on the 19th of March, correct? On February, you have to do it by- You have to register February by 20th. the 20th in order to vote on the 19th. Yes. Okay. I think that's important. And plus you gave us some news. You told us that there is no other party listed for the presidential preference other than Democrats and Republicans. No independents are listed. No Green Party is listed, just Democrats or Republicans. So if right. you'd like to vote on the 19th of March, you have to go and register for one of those two parties by the 20th of February, correct? Right. There are only five uh, five recognized political parties in the state of Arizona, the Democratic, the Republican, the Libertarian, the No Labels Party, and most recently, the Green Party has just um, gotten ballot, ballot status again. Um, any other party, so when people say independent, there is no independent party, um, although most people write that in. Um, if, the par if the independent party decided to organize and they collected signatures um, and they made they, they were able to meet that requirement um, just like the Green Party did, we would then have an independent party. But as of right now, anybody who is in that third bucket is just considered no party designated. Thank you very much for that information. That's news we can use, Gabrielle. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Thank you so much for that. You have cleared up a lot of information for us. You know, it's amazing how many things get out there that are not true. And especially in the age of all of the 
ability to be able to communicate on your phone and in other ways to other people. And people don't always know the facts. So when we have a fact producer telling us what the facts are, it's really important to be able to glean the information so you know what to do. I have another thing that I want to ask you. I've been, like I said, today on Tucson ag Agenda, there was some information about something that our senator from LD17 was doing, presenting a, a Senate Bill 1286 um, that has something to do that's happening right now. Are you familiar with that? I don't know which one. Okay, um, this is where Justine Wazak is supposed to be in a hearing today. Uh, and basically, um, she is wanting to prohibit the count, these voting centers that you were just telling us about. And instead, she wants to open up the schools so that people can go to the gym and vote. Are you familiar with that? I am not. I am not. A, I'm not aware of this particular piece of legislation okay. because there's maybe five of these and <laughs> last cycle there was five of them and there was five this the cycle before um one of the most recent um bills that i heard was trying to limit precinct uh go from vote centers to to precinct based um polling sites but would cap them at a thousand people per precinct I see. Which would, if we have 624,000 registered voters, oh we goodness. would be talking about 624 um, different locations and more in places where there was more population. Currently, the uh, elections department hosts 130. So imagine the you know, having to um, quintuple that number. Yeah. Um, think about the storage space, the amount of people yeah. that you would have to employ, um, the insane amount of cost associated yeah. with that. Um, and it doesn't provide any more meaningful um, access to people. That isn't a good use of taxpayer dollars. So it's really not thought out well. I was going to um, say, this is why you have to be careful who you vote for. You can't send people to the House and the Senate who come up with wild schemes and don't have any facts to base it on. Oh. So given and, all of this. <laughs> and in addition to that, um, the recorders and the elections directors, we've had multiple conversations about whether or not we should require schools to be voting locations. Mm -hmm. And because we don't have a national holiday, it, it's a school day. Yeah. It's a day where you have children on the premises and then you have strangers um, able to walk in and That's out right. of campus unchecked uh, without having to to sign in or to know where they are wandering on your campus as a former educator that's a serious concern for me um, and then also just recognizing that a lot of these locations are not as accessible as one would hope you know um especially for the elderly like the yeah. a lot of these um locations are designed for young children um or athletes um and their gyms and you know maybe they maybe they are all ADA compliant, but that ADA compliance means having to take an extra ramp around yeah. the building yeah. and an extra entrance. Those kinds of things um, are not helpful for voters. And so um, it you know there's some there's some really huge uh, issues that that people take with that um, because we are relying on um, the different locations to host us throughout the throughout the county um and and what our what our community needs and so yeah thank Take you so space. much for explaining that so succinctly and thoroughly the other issue that's out here is the the issue related to the low voter threshold and changing the dates of things. So I wanted you to speak to that before we talk about the dates people that we need. Yes. To answer. So I have been very opposed to. Um, so what's happening is in the 2022 legislature, they changed the recount margins um, so that it would trigger a recount 
at a much smaller uh, number and uh, or a much larger number, which means that we're going to have a lot of them. And this was a decision made by the state legislature without consultation of the elections directors who actually tabulate ballots. Mm -hmm. And so they pushed through, even though they were warned that there was going to be timing issues relating to the elections. And so they have been, uh, the elections directors have been very vocal about there being an issue and they're, and they're, and they're, uh, they've been really, um, asking for legislative help to to make a change. There were 15 solutions presented. Um, I would say 12 of them were pretty doable. And, and most uh, recorders and elections directors supported both. And then there was a couple that recorders were not 100% on. Um, me and another recorder being um, two of the most vocal about this. Um, one had to do with the change in cure uh, deadline. So a cure deadline, um, we have, depending on the election, between five or 10 days, uh, depending on, on the election type, to call voters to ask them about their signatures if we have a questionable signature. If we're not uh, able to... Um, clearly determine whether somebody somebody signed that ballot affidavit, we have to call them. We have to say, did you intend to submit this ballot? Um, you know, was there a reason why your signature doesn't match? And sometimes it's it's something like, oh, I broke my hand. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's, there's reasons that we have questions. And so um, currently um, we have five uh, business days um, to be able to call the voters and connect with them and and they can connect back and, and determine whether or not it was them who submitted this ballot. The legislature wants to change it from business days to calendar days, which would mean that the calendar day, the end of that deadline would fall on a Sunday, mm -hmm. um, which most people aren't checking their email. Mm -hmm. They're not answering phone calls. Um, they're less in, in rural and tribal locations. Um, they're less likely to have connectivity outside of those public spaces or workspaces, um, places where there's unreliable internet. And so I have been opposed uh, for that reason. Um, the other thing that they tried to add in was um, the codification of a signature verification guidebook, which would basically mean that they're taking a guidebook that's a best practice and they're making it into law. And we think that that will result in literally people coming to our offices, observing our process and saying, you're doing that wrong, that that signature needs to be invalidated, mm -hmm. um, which would mean litigation and delays <laughs> in and our cost. Work. <laughs> so we would actually extend the time. Mm -hmm. And so um, the the moving of a primary election date, um, I'm mildly opposed to it um, only because if they were to do it by next week, um, we would have enough time to alert the public of that. Um, but the, the longer they take, the less supportive I am of it. Mm -hmm. um, and we've also printed out a lot of materials and we've done a awesome. lot of outreach. Mm -hmm. And we're, you know, the outreach doesn't stop. And so um, I need the legislature to make a decision, but it should only be about those timeline issues yeah. and not about different processes that they just want to change because they can change them. I was um, under the impression they had until Friday to make up this decision. Is that true or is it not true? They voted on something today okay. and it isn't... Um, you know, it, it included included some of those provisions that um, that myself and some of the other reporters and the governor and the secretary of state's office did not agree with. So and it has to be signed by the governor to be approved. It does. And oh, it okay. also needs to have an emergency clause if it's going to be enacted uh, bef before the primary election. Otherwise, it wouldn't go into law. It wouldn't it wouldn't go into effect until next um until uh i think it's 90 days after um the close of the session which mm -hmm. who knows when that'll be 
Well, I'm really delighted to know that there's some hitches in the glitches in the <laughs> flies in the ointment <laughs> so that you can do the work that you've already set up to do for this election year. So why don't we talk about some of those dates so that the people who are listening will have them etched in their mind so they can put them on their calendars? Yes, sure. Um, so we have we're already in an active election for the presidential preference election. We mailed out. Um, our military and overseas ballots already. Uh, the last day to register to vote for the presidential preference election or make any changes to your record is February 20th by midnight or 11.59 p.m. Early, vo early voting will begin the very next day, um, which is February 21st. And you will have until Tuesday, March 19th to either vote or return your ballot. And we must have that within our possession uh, for that to count. Okay, good. That's important. Presidential yeah. preference for Democrats and Republicans. That's the 19th of March. And if you want to register, uh, if you're currently an independent or a part of another party and you want to vote on the 19th, you need to go and change your registration by the 20th of February. Perfect. <laughs> Okay, how about, is there another election coming up people need to know about? So we have we have th a total of three this year. Okay. So the very first, again, was the presidential preference election happening March 19th. The, the following uh, election will be the primary election, um, which is August 6th. August 6th is what um, we will then have um, let's say, for example, you have five Democrats running for one position. Um, what this election does is it narrows it down to just one. And if the Republicans have three candidates running for that same position, they narrow it down to one. And what will happen in the general election is they go toe to toe with any other uh, parties that have candidates. And that will uh, will be in November. On November 5th, we will have the general election. So, um, so the Arizona primary election is the 6th of August, the general election that does both the Arizona uh, election and also the presidential election will all occur on Tuesday, November the 5th. Did yes. I say that correctly? That is absolutely correct. You're going to be very busy, Kathy. We're a little bit busy. Yeah. Well, we really appreciate you taking time. I'm representing LD17. We're very active and engaged. Is there anything that we can do to assist voters in this process? Do you want to leave us with any words of wisdom before we close our interview today? Absolutely. What you can do is help people better understand these dates and these deadlines. Make sure that you're checking in, especially with your family unit. I can't tell you how often um, I'm getting a last minute text message from my father-in-law or my nephew um, asking me uh, information relevant to whatever election day we're closest to. Um, please make sure that you're directing them to our website and to our office. We're spending a lot of time making sure that the information uh, that's housed on our website is as clear and accessible as possible so that um, people can understand it in plain language. Um, we are making a very concerted effort to put this information out there and make it so easily available. Please help us share that. Um, please help yeah. us um, establish ourselves as the um, the authority uh, and 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 the truth uh tellers of Pima County uh because this is the source that you want to be able to um come to and rely on and make sure that uh you have the most accurate information uh relevant to your community well one thing for sure is you're an excellent truth teller and we really value having someone with your expertise knowledge and commitment as our Pima County recorder. It has really been delightful to spend time with you and to listen about the work that you're doing and for you to share your knowledge and your experience with us. It's just invaluable. Thank you so much, Gabby. Thank you so much for having me. Have a wonderful evening. You too. Bye-bye.